أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومصابيح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فقرأوا ما تيسر من القرآن صلى الله عليه محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله As tonight has the greatest probability of being the night of Qadr, I thought that in today's lecture, I would examine the phenomenon of revelation and look at how revelation was sent down to the Prophet of Islam, Rasulul Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I thought I would also discuss a little bit more about contemplating on the Quran as this is one of the best things that we can do on the night of Qadr. And then finally I will also explore the whole topic of when is the night of Qadr insha'Allah starting with Allah salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So with regards to the phenomenon of wahi and revelation and the types of revelation that were revealed to the Holy Prophet himself, we are told in Surah Shura, that verse number 51, that there are three types of revelation that were revealed to the Prophets. And Allah SWT describes these three types in the following words. He says, وَمَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَهُ اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَحْيًا أَوْ وَرَائِ حِجَابٍ أَوْ يُرْسِلَ رَسُولًا So what that means is that it is, it, it was not, it is not possible for any human being that Allah talks to them except in these three ways except through direct revelation or from behind a veil and a curtain or by sending an angel. So we have these three ways pointed out in this verse that Allah SWT talks to His prophets. He sends down revelation to them in one of these three ways. Sometimes, as we will see later on, in all three ways. So, the first way is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals revelation to them directly onto their heart. Second way is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to them from behind a veil, a hijab, a curtain. And the third way is by sending an angel to them. So now let's look at all three of these ways in more detail and we'll see how the revelation took place on the night of Qadr as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the very first way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses in this verse is direct revelation onto the heart of the Prophet. This was the most difficult way of receiving wahi by the Prophet. There was no way more difficult to him than this because he would feel the weight of it. He would feel the heaviness of it. In fact, it's reported that at such times, the body of the Holy Prophet would become very hot. His forehead would sweat. 
In fact, it's even reported that if at that time, Wahi, when he was coming down, the Holy Prophet happened to be on a mount, on a horse or on a camel, even that mount would somehow feel that heaviness. Such that that camel's stomach or that horse's stomach would, would, would bend and it would go near the ground. Allahu Akbar. So we see that this was the most difficult way of receiving wahi by the Holy Prophet. So this is one way. What example do we have of this type of revelation? Well, on Mi'raj, when the Holy Prophet Rasul Al-Akram Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam went on Mi'raj, he received revelation directly without any intermediary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this in Surah Najm where he talks about the Holy Prophet getting nearer and nearer and to the extent that فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ adna. He was so close, he was, at, he was like, he was as if he was at two bow's lengths or even nearer. Then فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to his servant whatever he reveals. The way this verse describes this is so beautiful. It, on purpose, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma awha, whatever was revealed to him. Because it's just too great to even try to describe it accurately in words. He just describes it in this very vague way. Whatever was revealed to him was revealed to him at that time. So this is an example of direct revelation onto the heart of the Prophet. The second way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes revelation to his Prophet is by means of doing it behind a veil. Min warai hijab. So now, an example of this was when Nabi Musa ala nabina wa alihi wa alayhi salam revealed, received revelation on the mountain of Tur. You will all recall that story when he goes on that mountain and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks with him but not directly through that tree on the mountain of Tur. So in that case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests himself and he manifests his speech through that tree. It is not that the tree is originating the speech. This is very important for us to bear in mind. It is still Allah talking. But he does it through the tree. It's like somebody is saying something to us, but from behind a wall, behind a door, behind a curtain. It is that person who's talking, but it goes through that intermediary. So the verse tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to Nabi Musa, Ya Musa, inni ana an Allah. Indeed, I am Allah, Rabbul Alameen, the, the, the Lord of the worlds. So this is the second type of revelation through or behind a tree or behind any type of veil. In this case, it was a tree. The third type of revelation is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to his prophet, but via an angel. So Jibra'il would come to the prophet and he would reveal things to the Prophet. In fact, we are told by Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that at such times, look how he describes the great station of Rasulullah. Today, I really wanted to concentrate on him. We looked at all, we looked at many prophets in the Quran, but today it's really appropriate to look at the Prophet of Islam because tonight was the night when he received the, the Quran upon his heart. So look how the sixth Holy Imam describes the Prophet and his status. He says that when Jibreel would come to the Prophet, despite Jibreel's great status, still he would sit in front of him like a humble servant. And Jibreel would not enter the presence of the Prophet unless he got permission from the Prophet beforehand. So this is the third type of revelation through an angel. Now, of course, when we look at 
all of these ways and we ponder how these revelations were revealed to the prophets, we can see the great station of the prophet. Because just imagine on this night of Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just reveal some verses to the heart of the prophet, didn't just reveal it to the prophet, for example, behind something or in another way, he revealed it directly onto the heart of the prophet and not just some verses, but the entire Quran. Just imagine how great the station of the prophet must have been on this night of Qadr that he was able to be the receptacle of receiving the entire Quran directly on his heart. Sallallahu alayhi wa wa alayhi wa So we see therefore that depending on the type of revelation and the station of the prophets, revelation will be sent down to them in different ways. Now, I mentioned the fact that this night is a night when the Quran was revealed on the heart of the Prophet directly. But now let's look at how we can benefit the maximum amount from this night. One of the greatest things that we can do on this night is to contemplate on these verses. The night of the Quran is a night of contemplation as well. So I discussed some of these things or some aspects of contemplation a couple of nights ago when we were looking at the whole issue of engaging with the Quran and contemplating on its verses. And I said on that occasion that in fact the Quran puts forward tadabbur as being one of its aims for revealing it in the first place. So then we looked at some practical tips as, as to how we can engage better with the Quran and how we, should, we can contemplate on it even more. So tonight I would like to develop this a bit further and look at it in different ways. In the chapter which is named after Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Verse number 24 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَكْفَالُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts forward a rhetorical question. He says that, do they not contemplate on the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts? Now, this rhetorical question, and in fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually rebuking those who don't contemplate on the Qur'an. He's effectively saying, why don't they contemplate on the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts? Now this is something for us to really consider in some depth, especially for tonight. What does this mean? Well, these locks, what are these locks that stop someone from contemplating effectively on the Qur'an? These locks, we are told, are none other than our own sins. When we have sins on our shoulders, and we have them around our souls. It's like our hearts are locked. They are unable to receive that great emanation from Allah. We are unable to benefit from the Quran to the maximum level. It's because we have these locks on our hearts. Now, let me illustrate this by putting forward this example. Just imagine there is a solar panel. This solar panel, what is, what is its role? Well, its role is to receive the, the rays of the sun so that it can now transform those rays into energy for that building, for that device, whatever the case might be. If somebody was to place a veil over this solar panel, like a very thick blanket, or if it happened to get covered with lots and lots of dust, and that dust happened to settle and became very solid, then what? Well, that solar panel would lose the effectiveness of receiving these solar rays and being able to transform them into energy for that building or that device. It's a similar thing that happens if we have sinned. What is the panel in this case? The panel is our souls, it's our hearts. What is that building or device? 
It's our bodies. We need that energy that is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of His spiritual emanations. And then our soul, which is that panel, needs to transform that into spiritual energy for our body, which is the building or that device. This is the role that sins play. The sins, therefore, are that veil. It's that thick layer of dust. It's that thick blanket that's preventing the rays of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from getting to our souls in the first place. So then how can we possibly benefit from the Qur'an if really our souls are not receiving the great blessings and the mercy of Allah in the form of divine revelation in the first place? This is how it works. So now let's look at how we can possibly remove these, these locks from our hearts. Well, just like every other lock, we need a key. Every lock, in order for it to be opened, requires a key. So a spiritual lock, which is the, our, the locks of our spiritual hearts, requires a spiritual key. What is this spiritual key that will unlock the sins of our hearts and enable it to receive these great emanations? It is none other than istighfar and tawbah, seeking forgiveness and repenting to Allah. This is why on this night, inshallah, another one of the greatest deeds that we can do is to seek repentance sincerely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to repent to Him. Now, let's just examine this in a little bit more detail and look at how merciful Allah is. Sometimes we think that, how is it going to work? I am such a sinner. After all of these years, all of those sins, Never despair of the mercy of Allah. Look at this verse in Surah Zumar. It is verse number 53. And always bear this in mind, especially, especially on this night of Qadr. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in this verse? In fact, Mawla Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamu says about this verse that there is no verse more expansive in its coverage than this verse. And that is because of the great number of linguistic subtleties that are mentioned in this verse. I'll go through these inshallah. Qul ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim la taqnatu min rahmatillah in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts forward so many beautiful points that we can gain inspiration from. And we learn that actually we should never despair from His mercy. Let's look at these. First of all, He says, Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. Look how he starts. Oh, my servants who have committed excesses over themselves. What a beautiful, respectful way of putting it. Ya ibadi. He does not start off by saying, Ya ayyuhalladheena amunu. Ya ayyuhal nas. Oh, those who have faith. Oh, people. He attributes his servants to himself by saying, Ya ibadi. Oh, my servants. He's using very caring words, words which give us a sense of his love for us. It's a very soft tone. Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. Look at the word asrafu. It means those who have committed excesses over themselves. What a respectful way of putting it. He doesn't want to say adlamu, which means those who have committed injustices. Those or for example, other nabu, those who have transgressed, even though we have transgressed, we are worthy of being addressed in that way. Those who have sinned, those who have transgressed, but Allah doesn't address us in that way. In fact, He doesn't even address us directly. What an amazing way of talking to someone respectfully. He talks to us in the third person. Those who have 
committed excesses over themselves. Really, we are worthy and we are so blameworthy of being addressed directly and being told that, look how much you have done wrong. But he does it in this way. And he uses the word committed excesses over themselves. It's like a father addressing his child. He's saying that actually you have just harmed yourself. You have just been, you've just been harmful to yourself. You have committed excesses on your own self. Allah is, the, is talking to us in this way. Then what he's saying? Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. If we had have stopped, there would have been enough. He's saying, don't despair of the mercy of Allah. He starts off here by saying, Inna, it means indeed, surely, it's for emphasis. Allahu yakfiru dhunuba jami'a. Look at the word al when in Arabic you have a plural like this, a broken plural, which is preceded by Alif and Lam, it denotes comprehensiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying He will forgive sins. No, not just forgive sins. He's saying He will forgive all sins. Al-Zunub. Then what? Even that would have been enough. On top of that, he then says, Jami'a, all of them. As if we needed Allah to even add that. But it's to denote His comprehensive mercy to us. That is like in English we say, Al Indeed, Allah will forgive all sins. And then we add the words, all of them. It's like, how much emphasis do you want to give to this concept of forgiveness? Then what? Innahu huwal ghafur rahim. Again, inna for emphasis. And then he says that he is all merciful and he is all, he is all forgiving, al ghafur, and he's all merciful. Out of all the names he could have used to end this sentence, which two names does he use? Al ghafur, the all forgiving. And Ar Rahim, the All Merciful. So, my brothers and sisters, let's bear this in mind on this night of Qadr, inshallah, that Allah will forgive us for all of our sins, inshallah, if we just turn to Him with sincerity and we resolve not to commit those sins again. And inshallah, this is the night that inshallah we can really turn to Him in sincere. Tawbah sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, continuing on the theme of using the Qur'an and contemplating on the Qur'an, sometimes this question arises that, okay, we see the importance of contemplating on the Qur'an, but sometimes we want to recite it just for the sake of recitation, just to improve our tajweed perhaps our fluency perhaps and our pronunciation just for the sake of thawab you have spoken so much about contemplating on the quran what about that doesn't that have any value and worth just reciting it for improving our fluency for improving our tajweed and our recitation skills and for the thawab of it what is the answer to this the answer is that recitation on its own is very important, extremely important, but it's even better if we recite with tadabbur, with contemplation. You see, the Quran is not like the speech of any human being. We examine exactly what we mean when we refer to the Quran as kalimutullah and kalamullah. It is the speech and the word of Allah. Therefore, even if we recite it, without understanding the meanings of the words, still there is great reward. This is from the, of the Rahmah of Allah and from the Rahmah of the Qur'an. That even without understanding, it's not like the speech of human beings. If we don't know Japanese, for example, we wouldn't try to read a book in Japanese. We don't understand it. The Qur'an is something else. So there is that benefit as well, even if we don't understand, 
But there's even greater benefit if we read it with understanding and with contemplation. Sometimes I like to put it like this. We should actually try and have a number of recitations going on at the same time. What's wrong with that? We can have faster recitations that will enable us to achieve those goals for the thawab, for improving our fluency, for improving our tajweed. And we can have a slower recitation which is for reading with contemplation. And in fact, we can mark the Qur'an in different ways using different types of bookmarks, maybe different colors or in whichever way you like. In fact, you probably have heard of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, the famous Muslim scholar. He reports this in his work, Kitabu Adabi Tilawat al-Qur'an. It's a book on the etiquette of Qur'an recitation. He says a Gnostic, like an Arif, a, a great mystic, a great spiritual person, once said this to him, that sometimes I complete the Qur'an every Friday. Sometimes I complete it every, week, every month. Sometimes I complete it every year. And he says, there's a Qur'an I've been reciting for 30 years, which I still haven't completed. Now, Ghazali commentates on this, what that Arif said. He says, this is because of the different levels of contemplation in his recitation. So, the one that he completes every Friday and every week, obviously he's not going to be able to recite it that slowly. He's not going to be able to contemplate that much. That is more of the recitation for the Thawaba recitation, for the recitation itself. The one that he, recite, he completes every month, that's with more tadabbur and more reflection and contemplation. The one that he completes every year is with even more and then he has the one where he's putting in the ultimate amount of his contemplation where he says he's been trying to complete it for the last 30 years and still he hasn't completed it sallallahu alaihi wasallam muhammad wa ali muhammad so we can surely do the same and read the quran at different speeds bearing these things in mind inshallah now I'd like to gradually bring this lecture to a close and look at this whole question as to when is the night of Qadr? Well, this is a question that's often asked, especially at this time of the year. And there are a number of opinions put forward with regards to this, but just in brief. The most common opinions put forward is that the night of Qadr is either on the 1st of Ramadan or on the 17th of Ramadan or the 19th, 21st, 23rd or the 27th. These are the most common opinions. However, there is a greater probability, first and foremost, that it is in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. We are told that Rasulullah Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the last 10 days of Ramadan he would engage in his worship even more and on the last 10 nights he would stay up and worship even more. So from this we get a big hint, we get a big clue. Also we have a tradition from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir where he says that the night of Qadr in every year is in the last 10 days of Ramadan. So these are some things that we can point to. And in fact, there are many traditions like the one I quoted from the fifth holy Imam. And they help us to understand that there is a greater probability that it is in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. We can never ever say for certainty which night it is. All we can do is put forward sort of like the I opinions as to the greater probability of when it is. So the last 10 nights it has a greater probability. Now what? From those 10 nights, the, the night that is even more probable is the 23rd night. 
What reasons do the ulama put forward with regards to this? Well, there are a few traditions. First of all, we are told about this tradition where this person, Abdul Rahman ibn Unais al Ansari, is also known as Al Juhanni. He asks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this question. He says to him that, I have many sheep and many camels, and I have many workers who work for me. Can you distinguish for me one night, and he says that my house is also far from Medina. So he's basically saying that it's difficult for me to come to Medina every night. So he says, can you distinguish for me one night in which I should come to Medina? So then the Holy Prophet calls him over and he whispers something in his ear. Now I'm sure we would all love to have eavesdropped at that time and heard what he said. But what the people did was that they observed when is this Al Juhanni coming to the holy city of Medina? And they observed that every year he was coming on the 23rd of Ramadan. So, this is one of the traditions that the ulama point to, and why they say that there's a greater probability that the night of Qadr is on the 23rd night of Ramadan. Another tradition we have from Imam Jafar Sadiq, where he also is addressing a question by someone. Someone asks him that if, first of all, he asks him, what nights have the greater probability of being the night of Qadr? So the Imam replies by saying the 19th, 21st, and the 23rd. And so the questioner asks him, if somebody, for whatever reason, cannot come on these three nights, then which night should he rely on? So then the Imam says the 23rd. So you see, like I said, we can't say with absolute certainty which night it is, and the Imams themselves never said to anyone like that, to the public at large, where, which night it was, or even directly. They would give clues in this way to certain people, what is the philosophy behind this? Sometimes people ask that, why? Why wouldn't they just say, well, look at it like this. First of all, isn't there great benefit in us staying up on all three nights and engaging in the worship of Allah? What have we lost if we do these great acts of worship on all three nights? That's one thing. So it's a way of us multiplying the thawab three times over, not just on one night. But we are also told by Mawla Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib He says that I know which night it was, and or which night it is, and I have no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept it secret from you out of His consideration for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, He's kept it secret out of consideration for us. And then he goes on to say, for if you knew which night it was, you would only perform good deeds in that night and not on any other night. So you see, it's a way of us engaging in more worship of Allah <laughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. some other things that we also don't know about? How about death? Why is it we don't know when death will come to us? It's so that we are always prepared. Why is it we don't know which is the greatest of all acts of worship? It's so that we engage in all acts of worship. Why is it that we don't know which is the greatest sin? It's so that we abstain from all sins. Yes, we are given clues and hints, but we don't know with absolute certainty it's for our benefit. Let me just end with this final tradition from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq As to the possible philosophy, why we can say, in fact, 
all three nights are significant. In fact, all three nights, according to this explanation, play a certain role and a very important role in our decree. The Imam says, the decree is on the 19th. The confirmation is on the 21st. And the signing off is on the 23rd. What does this mean? Well, this means that all three nights are significant in our destiny, our destiny, and our fate, in our decree. All three nights play a significant role because on the 19th it is the decree. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is decreeing something for us on the 19th. On the 21st, though, it is confirmed. And then on the 23rd, it is finally signed off. Let me illustrate it by leaving you with this final example. You apply for a job. Your application is accepted, but it is subject to confirmation. Then, can, is anything done and sealed? It's not until you sign the dotted line, isn't it? That's the signing off. It's just like that. So, on the 19th, it's like our application for that job has been accepted. But we get the response that it's been accepted subject to confirmation. The confirmation takes place on the 19th, but still nothing is done and sealed until we sign on the dotted line on the 23rd. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. So as a summary, today we looked at the whole phenomenon of revelation, bearing in mind it is the night of Qadr, or we can say the greatest probability of it being the night of Qadr tonight. Also, we pay tribute and we looked at the great receptivity of Rasulullah Akram because on this night it was this Prophet that received the entire book of revelation on his heart. We saw there are these three ways that Allah sends his revelation to his prophets. The first way is direct revelation, second is behind from behind a hijab or a veil and the third way is via an angel. The very first way was the most difficult and onerous for the Holy Prophet. And therefore, when we consider how difficult it was for him to receive direct revelation, then we get an idea of his greatness, especially on this night, how high he must have been in his spirituality to receive not just some verses, but the entire Quran on his heart on this night. Then we looked at the whole area of contemplation. We are told that if you have locks on your hearts, meaning sins, you will not be able to contemplate effectively. How do we remove those sins? Through the process of tawbah and istighfar. We saw that verse in Surah Zumar, the most comprehensive verse in his coverage according to Mawla Amir. And therefore we should not despair of Allah's mercy, especially on this night. We must seek true and sincere repentance to Him. Then we looked at how we can contemplate on the Qur'an more effectively and we looked at this whole idea of reading the Qur'an with different speeds. There's no problem reading it in different ways to gain extra sawab for improving our tajweed and our fluency. But at the same time, we should have another recitation taking place where we are engaging in contemplation. Finally, we try to address this question of when is the night of Qadr. We are told there's a greater probability uh, that it is in the last 10 nights. Then we are told out of those 10 nights, the greatest probability is on the 23rd night because of those traditions and those reasons we put forward. But others have even explained how, in fact, all three nights, 19th, 21st and 23, are also significant because each one plays an important role in the decree of our destiny and our fate for the entire year. Let's pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, by the right of your great book, by the right of Rasulullah, by the right of this night, decree for us that which is best for us 
in our dunya and in our akhirah, inshallah. Oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers, forefathers for our sins. Oh Allah, bless us with the tawfiq so that this is not the last night of Qadr that we experience. Oh Allah, bless this center and all those who frequent it. Oh Allah, there are many people facing difficulty around the world. Bring them relief. And O oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala, Farajul Sharif, Wassalamu Alaikum.